So I am, um, we're here for a fireside chat, <laughs> um, except that we have no fire. Um, but I'm joined by my wonderful colleagues um, and great friends, really, Leslie Christian and John Fullerton. I'm going to let them each briefly introduce their uh, current organizations to you all. And if others join us, they'll sit in the front row, but among us here, we're now in a, in a chat. However, before we start our chat, um, we're going to orient our conversation with a few slides from John. But before you do your slides, John, just a brief introduction of you and Capital Institute, and then sure. Leslie, you too. Uh, so, um, I'm John Fullerton, and I, I spent 20 years almost at J.P. Morgan, left in 2001, and um, founded the Capital Institute a couple years ago to really go beyond sort of the current conversation about sustainability, and particularly with the idea that the economic system is creating a sustainability crisis, and the financial system and our finance practice drives the economy. So questioning finance was sort of the leverage point to focus on, plus it's something I knew a little bit about. Leslie? And I'm Leslie Christian. I also have a background uh, on Wall Street. Uh, worked at, I have, I think the distinction of every firm I worked for related to Wall Street is is, is, is no longer there. Um, <laughs> but my, the majority of my time was with a firm called Solomon Brothers uh, in New York. And um, I too have moved from the mainstream financial world to the world of um, systems thinking with respect to ecological and financial limits. Uh, most recently I was with a company called Portfolio 21 Investments where we created a mutual fund to focus on environmental sustainability. I'm now um, part-time with a firm called North Star Asset Management based in Boston. And I am working on framing the whole investment uh, conversation to include limits. So for those of you who are joining us in the room, um, we decided we were going to turn this into a fireside chat. Uh, we had several of our colleagues who were here join us, and you'll stay where you are and, and uh, participate, although not quite as intimately as, as our group here on stage. So please stay close. Come up close uh, in your chairs and um, and enjoy this conversation with us. So again, John, if you don't mind, we'll have you uh, cue your slides, and then we'll. I, I was going to not use the slides, but I think there's a few. Mostly, they're pictures okay. that I think will provide a good framing for the conversation. Um, so the the topic is what um, we're now calling financial overshoot. And so I'm, I'm going to start by walking through what we mean by overshoot in general, particularly ecological overshoot, and then try to connect that to this idea that we're also in, in, a, in a situation of financial overshoot, which I believe is the sort of the diagnosis that hasn't yet been understood by many people that are deep in the sustainability conversation. Um, and then Leslie's going to shift more and talk about, so given that framework, how does that force us really to respond as investors and imagine we could have a similar conversation about how do we respond as policymakers, but we're not going to do that um, today. And how do we respond if we were because CEOs Met of companies? Because and President Obama took care of it for yeah, us. Yeah, it's all last done. Night. It's all <laughs> done. It's taken care yeah. of. Um, so does that make sense as a frame? Totally. Um, so this is kind of weird doing a slideshow, but you guys can watch That's here okay. and yeah, you guys right. can Everything will be fine. Um, watch there. So, you know, this is one of these classic, um, I, I promise we will all hear this more and more, this is a classic quote, but um, I, I tend to start off these conversations with this simple reality that was said, by the way, at least 40 years ago. Um, this isn't a new idea. Um, perhaps the more new idea is, uh, is combining that with one of Albert Einstein's sayings, and, and I asterisked it because apparently he may not have actually said it, um, but <laughs> Um, so, f full disclosure, I think he said it in response as a joke to a question, um, but it's true. And if you think about those two statements together, um, it's really where the, um, I think the rubber meets the road on sustainability and the jets must have interfered. Um, this is now kind of the generalized way of talking about this is that we've entered a new geological epoch. Um, the, the Economist a year ago had a cover story saying, welcome to the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is the period of time where the human economy and its impacts actually will determine the course of um, the health of the planet. So um, most of the conversation that you hear in the public media is all about you know, business cycle issues, boom, bust, how do we get the economy growing? 
and no one's really recognizing that things are different now, and it's always dangerous to say this time's different, but in, in a way that is different than people expect, I think this time is different. Um, this slide is, I think, a really important conceptualization of the problem. This comes from a research paper, peer-reviewed research paper uh, issued years ago called um, Safe Operating Space. And the idea, I won't go through it in detail, but the idea is there's, I think, nine um, topics here um, or, 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 or aspects of a healthy biosphere that need to remain in balance, ranging from the carbon cycle, which is mentioned as uh, climate change, to the nitrogen cycle, to fresh water, uh, wa fresh water availability, um, to biodiversity. And uh, what the scientists tried to do is first measure where we stand as a planet on all of these critical uh, biophysical systems and then see where we should be if we're going to stay within this safe operating space. So the idea is that the human economy has been expanding exponentially for hundreds of years and we're now breaching the boundaries of this safe operating space which is visually uh, shown as the green circle. So for example, you see on the top climate change we're already, on a, we're already breaching through the safe operating space on climate, not because the, the CO2 today is breaching it, but because we're clearly on a path where we will breach it. Um, and without going through each of them, obviously the alarming point is that biodiversity loss is already far worse than climate change. And, by, and all of these things, all these systems are connected. So it's, it's not like it's okay if one's bad, but the other ones are fine. We actually have to operate the economy so that everything is within the green space as a, as a visual. So, you know, this, this is a shocking chart. Uh, it's not nearly well enough understood by people who, quote, run the world. Um, this is another way of thinking about it done by the Footprint Network. Um, they've sort of thrown all those things together and come up with a nice, simple, easy to understand metric, which is how many Earths are we using? Um, the, the Earth can regenerate its natural capital uh, miraculously, but it has a limit of how much you can do that, and they calculate that we now effectively use up every year 50% more of the Earth's ability to regenerate natural capital um, than happens. So as a result, the stock of natural capital goes down each year. So this idea is what's called ecological overshoot. Now, we don't have time to debate all that, and I'm not a scientist, but, but that, within the science community, that's, a, that's not a controversial idea, that's accepted wisdom, and most people in the ecological um, and, and science uh, sphere look to the economists and the people running the world and, and wonder why, you know, why are you people so crazy to think we can keep expanding the economy, which has this expansionary aspect on the footprint, the ecological footprint in the process. So what I'm very focused on is then translating that, um, uh, what, what, you know, what does that do for um, the financial system or how is the financial system exposed to that or more importantly, how the financial system is actually driving that from a systemic design perspective. And what this chart is intended to show is that our financial system is predicated on a debt-based ex compound interest expansionary monetary system and financial system. So we've actually architected by design, a financial system that drives exponential material growth and drives us into this condition of ecological overshoot. That is, um, is a problem, but the more challenging problem is getting ourselves back. You know, imagine the roadrunner that ran off the cliff and is out there in, in space. We need to get back to a, a situation of, uh, um, of ecological stability and we're going to need to land the financial system, hopefully as gently as possible, in the process. And that won't be easy to do, and I think that's the piece of this that um, most of the, of the people talking about sustainability and we're going to you know, do this, do that, this other thing, haven't really processed. And so let me try to make that real. Um, there's a, a very important research report done about a year ago out of Carbon Tracker in Europe where they took the... Um, uh, the conventional wisdom now in science, which is that if we want to, uh, and I'm just focusing on, on carbon now, but you could, you, could, you could extrapolate this on many of the other uh, systems of the planet. If we accept the two degree warming threshold as the important threshold that we don't want to cross, you can calculate how much carbon we need to put, we, we, we have left to put in the atmosphere 
before we breach that. And that works out to be this 565 gigatons of carbon. And then you can actually calculate how, how much carbon is embedded in the proved fossil fuel reserves on the balance sheets of the world's largest corporations and the nation states that own the large pools of fossil fuels. This is coal, oil, natural gas. And it turns out that um, we actually have already discovered and have on the balance sheets of these companies five times more carbon embedded in the fossil fuels than the scientists say we can put in the atmosphere. So if you turn that other way around, in other words, we actually need to figure out a way where we don't burn 80% of the fossil fuels that are already valued in the capital markets. And then I did a little very rough calculation that says that that value, that 80% of value, has a current market value of about $20 trillion. And $20 trillion is in contrast to the subprime direct loss from the subprime crisis of $1.7 trillion. So I'm not suggesting we need to take a $20 trillion right off tomorrow and the economy is going to go in the ground, but um, it kind of gives you a sense of why it's going to be so difficult to, uh, to shift our economic system. This $20 trillion is, goes a long way in, in, uh, in, in pushing our denial. And so uh, Bill McKibben is actually onto this issue now, and he's just written a, a, a really crushing piece in Rolling Stone called The Terrifying New Math. And I think, you know, unfortunately, this is, this is what we need to deal with. And to just summarize then back to the financial system, if we have ecological overshoot, then by definition, we have an economy that's predicated on this continued exponential growth, and therefore there's all of these, um, in a sense, off-balance sheet liabilities that aren't yet recognized in the accounting that we're going to have to recognize and we're going to have to come to grips with, or we're going to trash the planet and make it a place we don't recognize. Um, so ironic. Yeah, a little, little fossil fuel burning going on. Um, you know, think about the price earnings multiple of any stock or the stock markets in general. They're all predicating exponential growth. So if, if I were to stand up and say to the world, and they actually believed me, that there will never be economic growth, the PE multiple would collapse, the f stock market would collapse. Think about the debt capacity of countries. It's all predicated on an exponential growth of the tax receipts which is predicated on exponential growth of the economy in order to balance all these budgets that are already way out of whack. Same, you know, I don't, I'll just cut this short, but same point about pension liabilities, underfunded pension funds, same about how the endowments work on all of the world's foundations. They're all predicated on exponential growth. So um, the point is that we, we have this kind of reckoning we need to deal with if we're serious about moving our economic system back into the, the so-called safe operating space of the planet. And now that I've laid out the problem, I'll take it over and I'm going to leave it to my friend here to <laughs> give us all the answers. <laughs> so um, I think it's clear from, from what John has, has pointed out that there really are no powerful, uh, in power forces with a vested interest in pursuing what it means to be in financial overshoot. Um, it's, it's not in the interests of our government, uh, our political leaders, as we heard last night. Uh, the only thing that, that, that we can talk about is, is jobs and growth. So, and anything to do with green is, uh, is a, hot, uh, red, a hot potato. Um, it's not in the interests of the owners of the financial assets or the, or the real assets that have been valued uh, at levels that are not uh, sustainable uh, in, a, in a low growth or no growth uh, environment. So it takes a lot of courage to be willing to think about things at this level from the perspective of what really is going on. Now, are we 100% sure about this? No. Are we 0%? Are we 1%? 2%? No. We're pretty, we're pretty sure. I think we're sure enough that we better pay attention to ecological overshoot and its implications for the financial system. And Therefore, um, for me anyway, the question is, well, what do I do now? And, and I think that 
I think John said this. He, he either said it privately a few minutes ago or just now, I can't remember. But, but the, inc the inclination is uh, when confronted with this sort of monumental information that is, that is disturbing, it's, it's t so tempting to, to just go, go to what you know and go do something and work on it and make things better and hope for, hope for things to get better and, and focus on change and making the world a better place. And those are all really critical things. I, however, think that unless we build a new framework for working, we're not going we're, we may take care of ourselves, we may feel sort of fulfilled that we're making some sort of a difference in our day-to-day -day lives, but we're not really addressing these huge issues that are driving essentially the, the, the survivability of, of the, the human species. So, um, not to mention the planet, or, or life on the planet. So, um, about a year ago, at this conference actually, um, Don Schaefer and I presented a paper that I had worked on with RSF called The New Foundation for uh, Investment Management. And in it, we critiqued modern portfolio theory, which is the sort of, it's, it's the scapegoat. You know, you just say modern portfolio theory and you can kind of get all worked up and <laughs> kind of angry. And, and, it, and it, it, it's not, it's really kind of a innocuous, thing, it's a theory, but it's achieved the level of, 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 of religion, of God, whatever. So in that, in that paper, we talked about needing to redefine risk in terms of ecological limits, needing to think, rethink return in, a, in a, a, an environment of, of potential no growth or, or negative growth of conventional GDP, and we needed to address the utility or the, the usefulness that people find in their investments. The, what is it that satisfies people when they make uh, economic decisions? And um, those were all really, I, to me that was a great start. And I'm now moving to this, this next place of realizing that um, this question of what does over, overshoot really look like is the question that evokes uh, the grief that Chris Jordan talked about this morning. It evokes sadness and grief, and until we recognize that, until we live it, we are not going to get to the other side, which is, in, her, in his words, is love or joy. We're not going to be able to really address overshoot unless we've confronted what it, what it means. Um, and so I think that we need to spend a significant amount of brain power and, uh, and soul power and heart power on looking at the, the evidence and making some very well-educated estimates of what the world will look like. And we're not talking 50 or 100 years down the road anymore. I just read Jeremy Grantham's paper, uh, he's a big shot money manager and he, he's got a paper out. He's been writing about resource prices for a couple of years and I think he said it's, you know, it's, it's 10 to 15 years before we, we, we see the, the, the marginal impact of food and energy prices and water shortages that are actually going to now really impact economic performance. It's, it's already happening, it's just that it's happening to people who are marginalized, and so we're not we're not measuring it in in, in our in our pricing system. So um, I encourage all of us to do that hard work. I'm also going to say just quickly that I don't I, I tr I've been trying not to use this kind of language, but I'm going to use it anyway. I think that we're going to come out better. We're going to be we're going to be better off than all those people who are in denial. And that really, it, 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 let's just quit trying to worry about convincing all the rich people, the, you know, the, the, the people with all the power, and even, even the government. I mean, if we do our work and build our, our new frameworks, we're gonna come out really strong. And the rest of it, unfortunately, has a good chance of sort of crumbling and fading away. And I don't want that to happen to most people. 
but there is a bit of a little competitive nature in me that says, you know, get on the bandwagon because you're the ones who are going to really be hurt. We've, we're going to figure this out. Uh, these people, the, all this, the stranded asset issue, it's not just oil, it's a lot of other things. And remember that, that all this wealth that we're talking about is an entry on a, on a, on a balance sheet. It's, a, it's what we call mark to market. One stock traded at a price, every other stock in the world is priced at that price and ca called wealth. And that is not stable. <laughs> that doesn't, that there, is no, there is no God that's telling us that that's the value of that, of that stock or anything else. So uh, I think it's a double-edged double piece here where, we, where we're making a really smart move and we're making a really soulful move to work to build, build this new framework. So with the delicious irony of all the fossil fuel flying overhead. So as wonderful. We're, as we're all obviously observing. Um, what I was going to ask those of us upstage, on stage, who joined early for this chat, um, can each of you, if you don't mind, just give us the one or two words that this presentation has evoked in you? Don't, I don't want you to go on. I just want to, <laughs> I want to hear right from here like the one or two words that are on top of your mind as you listen to this, starting with you, if you don't mind. Confusion. Confusion. Evan. Yeah, somewhat conflicted. Conflicted. Uh, I definitely feel resonance with it, the work that I do. I hate to be slightly negative, but it feels like we're going about this whole impact investing thing the wrong way. Wrong way. Oh, oh. Which thing? Impact the, investing. The way that we're approaching impact investing, that we're just taking the current system and saying, if we just plug in social and environmental factors and just drive investment in those sectors that we're going to be better off and that doesn't, it doesn't feel right after listening to conversations like this. Full disclosure, David was Capital Institute's first fellow, so he's been well trained. <laughs> oh, come on, you didn't have to say that. I was going to say, wow. <laughs> Probably two things. One would be the confusion thing, but also um, opportunity. It's a bit exciting. It's kind of a breath of fresh air to have it out in the open and, uh, and a little bit nervous, like where's it going to lead? It's interesting because what came over me as I was listening was sadness. Um, so I'm really glad that, that along with my sense of sadness and your sense of confusion and your sense of resonance, we have a sense of hope. <laughs> the, um, uh, I don't know how many of you were in the plenary, it was the plenary session in Cowell the other day, but it, uh, one of the speakers on stage was Wayne Silby. Were you, some of you at that conversation? One of the things that really hit me was something that he said, and it wasn't actually, it wasn't a, it wasn't really part of his formal remarks. It was towards the end of the session when we were, they were doing some questions and answers, and he was getting really frustrated. And uh, he said, some swear words, I think. And then he said, I would offer, Wayne, are you in this room, by the way? Okay, Wayne, uh, is he? Oh, good. I thought you might good be here. You Could asked. you come over here? <laughs> Closer, please. <laughs> so you can, you can cop to this statement. So the sentence that you uttered was something like, why the hell can't we get an economist? I'll offer nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize for the modeling of, can you finish that sentence for us? I well, mean, it was so the, apt. Thank you. The, uh, you know, we're in the investment management business, and... Uh, <laughs> In terms of optimizing portfolios and that kind of thing, especially when you think of risk. And the question is today is that so many of us in our economics, in this free market system, everyone's trying to maximize their own situation. And you wonder what would happen in an econometric model if it could be done if just two or three percent of our monies, if we all took two or three percent of our monies and said, you know, Maybe the return is not. What's important is ecological balance, equal opportunity, social justice. And I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll help out on that microfinance thing where I don't get the same kind of return I was expecting in my other. What I'm suggesting is that I would nominate for Nobel Prize in economics. You have to give me the nominating address, but the uh, person who could show that if, in fact, you did something like that, that the stability, the volatility, of the rest of your investments would be more assured, which means that any portfolio manager would say, oh, I'll take that any day. Because right now, in the prudent man rule and others, you're supposed to just look out for yourself. But actually, if there were some kind of prudent woman rule, if you will, 
where you actually looked out for everyone with some part of your money. With some part of your money, it may be that you're actually optimizing your entire portfolio and doing better than you are today. Thank you very much. The well, one thing I would just say on, on optimization is that um, you know when, when someone does write that Nobel Prize winning um, economic model, it undoubtedly, in my mind, it, it will certainly be modeled after nature and natural systems. And one thing I've learned from um, people that understand that stuff, like Janine Benyus and Biomimicry, is that nature doesn't optimize, it balances or it operates in harmony. So our, our whole language, we immediately default to, well, what are we supposed to optimize? And in fact, I, I suspect that is, is part, of the, part of the problem. I see something. It's, it's exactly, I mean, it's, it's exactly why I, I thank you. I'm so glad Wayne was here. I mean, to me, what was resonant in listening to the two of you and then thinking about his comment the other day and in just sort of my observations of the last few is that, I think it was your point, we're sort of going about this the wrong way. And so then the thing that you and I have talked about sometimes um, when, when they and I have been together talking more informally about this, um, particularly with Leslie's portfolio management uh, background and work, I then look at her and I say, but you know there's fear involved. Um, and I don't remember, I'm never very good at remembering where fear goes with the denial grief <laughs> spectrum, you know, whether I, I experience them in the right order even. <laughs> but um, but uh, I, for those of you who are up here on stage, um, and, and particularly if Leslie, you could speak to this, you know, what are the things that you think about actually starting with? You know, you say we need to like be thoughtful, we need to sort of grasp this and then we need to be thoughtful rather than just all of us being so action-oriented. But if I'm not the only one who, 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 for whom that generates a little fear, mm -hmm. and I mean actual personal fear, yeah. mm -hmm. like I'm gonna lose my money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, we're, or something's gonna happen that's really bad to me personally in order to get us all to the place mm -hmm. that's um, more mm -hmm. harmonious, more balanced. And I don't think there's a human on earth that's courageous enough not to not to feel fear at that point in time. So any thoughts about that for either of you, but maybe starting with you? Sure. Uh, two things. One, uh, I had a really great conversation over the weekend with Mark Fincer, where he, it wasn't just with me, but it really hit me, when he talked about the, all this stuff that we're talking about, about nature and cycles and systems. Nature involves death, right? Death and dying. And so, Part of the fear that we're feeling is a very deep, really deep fear of death. Right. And there's volumes written, not by me, mm. on death and our fear of death. Well, we're talking about the death and dying of a way of life, of a system, of an era, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, the first thing in my mind is to embrace that fear. I mean, it sounds corny, but it's true. Embrace it. It's natural. It's okay. You can't get rid. It, it's a. It's a feeling. It kind of comes. It floats along. It comes in. It overwhelms you. You feel it, and then you say, "That's my feeling. It's a feeling of fear, and I'm going to experience it rather than running away." Because I remember years ago reading something called *The Denial of Death*, a very well-known <laughs> book, which, it, it, which brings up the point that denial is is the least. In my opinion, anyway, I, mean, I think all of us would agree, denial is, is, is the, the least um, positive right. response, and yet it's the natural. We want, we want to just run to denial. Now, in terms of what I would recommend, sort of tomorrow, what am I going to do? Um, what I am going to do, and I, I'm still working on this, I'm just kind of, I've taken a little bit of a break, a little bit of, I, I laugh about spending some time on the couch, both kinds of couches, the therapy couch and the, <laughs> the, uh, the living room couch. <laughs> Do you just move your couch into the office? <laughs> I have the great Universal system. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I see Leslie on this rolling couch. That's right. <laughs> Talking to herself. <laughs> anyway, um, so what I, I've decided that I'm going to just start with some some of the stuff that seems pretty pretty well known. I mean, again, you don't know 100% sure, but just start with some of the facts about population, and then and, and about food supplies and food prices and and water supplies and water distribution and energy and just kind of lay those out and then instead of going immediately to well how can we 
how can we get renewables in the system and how can we uh, teach population control or how can we do this or how can, just live with those facts and really think about how that plays out. What does that look like as it plays out? Then look at what, what are the logical sort of, this is where my logical brain comes in. Okay, what, is, what are the economic characteristics of, of this played out system? What, what's gonna happen? What, what'll happen with, with, with food systems and what'll happen with transportation and clothing and housing and you know, luxury goods and iPads and iPhones and on and on, and, and begin to develop a new, um, just sort of a, 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 a really, a, 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 I, I'm gonna use the word framework again, but a discipline around how, how we make investment decisions. So rather than starting with, I'm gonna put 60% in stocks and 30% in bonds and 10% in real, real property, you start with what, what's my vision for this economy? Not my vision, not what I want it to be. What do I think it's going to look like? And then where do I, where can I or should I plug in my money? And it's going to be different for everybody. Some people are going to be very exploitive in their choices and others will be more community based. Yep. And that's a choice. That's where you have choice. And um, then you, once you come to that sort of piece, and, and there'll be preferences, there'll be places you'd rather plug in than others. Um, then you can start to say, well, what is the structure that works here? Should I consider uh, some sort of a loan? Should I consider a gift? Should right. I consider a grant? Should I start a co-op? Should I start a new company myself? Should I do some equity investing? What, what should it look like? But that, that structural decision is way down the pike from that original framing and visioning piece. So that's what I'm going to work on. Uh, what I'm thinking about and, and going to more work, work on more concretely in the next uh, few months. So if I got that, I'm going to paraphrase it to see if I got it. It's sort of, it's, it's kind of like scenario planning in the sense that you need to take the time to look wh whatever issue area you decide to start with, sort of think about what it's going to look like if the scenario of limits plays out and then plan as well as you can your investments or your your personal investments as well as your capital investments accordingly. Yes, like, and so, I, I want to just tell a quick anecdote yeah. about scenario planning. So, um, a few years ago, I took a course put on by the Global Business Network. These are the people who have developed scenario planning based on the Shell Oil methodology. They're former, some of them are former Shell people. They're very highly regarded. They operate around the world, and they have a, a one-week session actually here in the Bay Area on scenario planning. My group, which was uh, Susan Burns, who's the co-founder of the Ecological Footprint Network, and Kirsten Henningsen, who I worked with at Portfolio 21, and a couple of other people who we kind of roped in, we had a group, and we, we part of the process of scenario planning is to come up with a, a, a quadrant system. And you've got, um, so, so our quadrants were, GD, one was GDP growth, and we had positive GDP growth and negative GDP growth, growth, and then across the horizontal axis we had uh, uh, communal co cooperation and collaboration and sort of on your own um, individualism. And those were the, 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 the scenario, those were the basis for the scenarios that we were going to work with. We got up to present our scenarios to the group, to the experts, to the people who were putting on the conference, well-known names that you would recognize and to our co-groups, and they laughed at us. <laughs> and they told us we were naive, and that we were silly, and how could we possibly ever think that we'd have negative GDP? How could that ever happen? That's ridiculous. That's not gonna happen. You're, you've got, your, you've got your, your scenarios are just not well-founded. That is the kind of thinking that we are dealing with here. That's why I wanna repeat, it takes, it takes some courage. Take some guts to say, well, you know, I want to think about that because I really think there's some reasons that we might actually see some real, some real, real declines. So I have a big question for you, but before I ask it of you, um, the three of us can easily observe that our colleagues here on stage are of a slightly different age than we are, <laughs> um, and so at least slightly. Uh, in some cases, maybe more than slightly. Um, and so I think we have a, a, some, some, some set of more than one generation represented here with us. And it's, I, I actually thought if we could pass the microphone around again, 
if each of you were, and you have to be brief, because we've got very much a time limit here, but in a sentence or two, you've listened to this exchange about thought and then sort of scenario planning, but I want to know what's going through your minds again right now in this context. So, you know, as you sort of start to think, well, what will I do? Um, maybe with the benefit, in some cases, for those of you who are younger, that you don't actually have much of a portfolio yet. So in a way, that's a real advantage. Maybe there's, maybe there's more opportunity and, and less of this kind of fear. So Jesse, I'm going to start with you. A couple of sentences. And if you get, if you get long-winded, I may have to cut you that's off. That's fine. No, I, I'll try not to. So I think this issue of fear uh, really resonates with me as somebody who's moved through a transitional period in my life and now the work that I do at the Hub is focused on a lot of recent grads who are approaching a new economy with a lot of fear. And a lot of people who are saying, I want to do good in the world, but I don't know how to engage with it because here's this paradigm that will pay me, that will meet the expectations for prestige and status. Mm. Um, so I think a question of what does the personal transformation look like at transitional phases for people at my age, but as well as people who are in mid-career changes is a really, really important one, addressing that fear. Evan, what comes to mind to you? The conversation really resonates with me because this is exactly how I think. And um, also, I also work for The Hub and, and for SOCAP and, and what I'm very passionate about and, and looking at, as his point was that we're approaching these things the wrong way and this is a very systems level approach. Also it brings up to me, which I think is challenging, is that there's these structural elements and these are getting brought up, but there's also the cultural and the worldview elements. And that doesn't get talked about very much, and that's really hard, is that someone taking the investment approach that you're talking about, first they have to change their worldview, the way they're thinking about the system, then they can take a structural approach to it. And some of the work Jesse and, and all of us are doing, I think, are actually on that line between the two. Even the axis that you sh you'd mentioned was GDP, which is more structural, and cooperation, which is more worldview. And I think that's a really fascinating conversation and one that's challenging to have and hope to see more of. And can I just say really quickly, I think, I think an important... No. <laughs> I think the interventions that may work there hinge around community building and storytelling. Very important, yeah. Kristen, what, what's, what's your thought? Uh, well, I represent a community-based organization and a nonprofit that stands for social justice. So um, I guess maybe fear resonates because we're already serving people who are greatly marginalized by today's economy. And so as I hear you talk and, you know, as we tr struggle with balancing donations and support and how to really sustain our community. And you talk about ecological sustainability, but we really look at just even our community of San Francisco and how do we make it work for so many people who are just not already included. Um, so that is different from what I thought I was going to listen to, but it's bringing up a lot um, for me about how to kind of make that work, and that's probably the confusion that I'm feeling. And then also, we do have an endowment that we manage, and how do we, you know, we do social responsible investing, and I think to this gentleman earlier, we do really think about how to, you know, um, put our money to work in a way that is true to our values. Um, and it's different, and you know we sacrifice return for that. But um, so I'm really interested, kind of how we're going to go next in terms of that portfolio structure. You, you, you hang on to that because I've got a mic. But, yeah, um, Jason. Um, my name is Jason Bradford, and um, I came at this as an ecologist. Actually, I've got a doctorate in biology and was an academic ecologist. So I was the scientist that wasn't being listened to, and then I I got into nonprofit work, and then I was a nonprofit activist that no one paid attention to. So I'm resonating with what you were saying, <laughs> and because your culture is looking at you and saying you're a nut, you know, even though you've got the degrees and mm -hmm. you know the data better than your culture does, and so it's really hard. So what I said was that I looked at the I connected the money system to kind of why we're an ecological overshoot and uh, red limits to growth and all that, and went. Are you kidding me? You know, so, so then I came to finance, basically investment, from the perspective of um, this is the frame that our, our, that our culture has right now, and I'm going to try to give them a no regrets financial instrument that helps us deal with this problem. Huh. I think for me, the two different feelings, the one of the confusion or fear, and then the opportunity. The, the confusion or fear is more on the selfish, personal kind of level of um, thinking about your own, like, 
how do I make sure that I provide for my children and that I don't make terrible decisions that mean that what we have at the moment vanishes and, and we're in a bad position. Um, but the opportunity or um, excitement there is more around going to that framework kind of level of how do we, you know, whether it's in our work or in our own thinking, um, do some of those things that will set in motion um, changes that, that then will put us in a, in a better position to deal with whatever does end up happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name's David Nicola. Uh, I'm a business school student at, at Duke. I actually come from, a, come from a background of conservation and then to finance and trading and back to conservation, back to business school. But I want to make, I guess, three quick points, one of which is that when I went to business, when I went to business school, so enveloping yourself in, in, in an area where people aren't usually thinking about these kinds of things, uh, people are more open-minded than you than you expect, and maybe that is a generational thing. I, I don't know, um, but that is one positive aspect. Number two, uh, slightly uh, more on the negative side, is that nobody thinks about environment, whether it's recycling, conservation, ecological overshoot, at all in any way, shape, or form. In the business school, there's a heavy focus on social, but nothing that incorporates the two. Um, and the third one is: can we phrase these ideas? and we know that semantics are sometimes a problem, can we phrase them in the language that people understand? Yeah. A focus on GDP growth is a violation of economics 101 principle where you're an idiot if you maximize res revenue and you need to maximize profit. That is a clear violation of something that people easily understand. So is there a way of speaking in that kind of language and saying, we don't want companies that grow, we want companies that are cash flow positive. So they're never gonna grow, but they're gonna be cash flow positive, you still make a return. People might be able to understand that and then you can kind of trick them into adopting yeah. the language of the new system. But I think your last comment is everyone is sort of, <laughs> at least I can't see everyone out here, but everyone up here anyway is, is sort of going like this. I want to open it up to the audience for questions, but John, my, my big question for you, at least it's big in the sense that it requires a lot of candor from you, is um, you've, you've thought about this a lot, and you, I know because we've talked personally about it, have, have made significant shifts in your own portfolio. I mean, you, you are really trying to take a new approach to portfolio management for yourself. And I know also you have to care for your family. I know that you, you know, you like all of us have those, have those selfish instincts. How far along that path are you? I mean, how would you rate yourself? <laughs> um, can I respond to Kristen's comment first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was like, no, I, just, I, I just wanted to say, it always I, works like this. Man. I think the, um, this issue of, you know, are you just, do you care more about trees than people to, to put it in? I know you didn't say that, but it, it's really important to me. And I, and mm -hmm. I think, um, I think that's a false choice. And I think we need to get beyond that. Um, and I totally understand where it's coming from. But this, um, this idea of triple bottom line is wrong, in my opinion. Um, the, the triple bottom line has a hierarchy mm -hmm. and our, our wealth and our prosperity is dependent on a healthy ecosystem and ecosystem function and mm -hmm. so that's why I, I'm so passionate about the, the ecological sustainability issue. It's, it's, it's not because, I mean I love the nature as much as anyone but I didn't enter this conversation as a, as a green person or as a naturalist but it's just mind-numbingly obvious to me that if we don't put ecosystem function, healthy ecosystem, as the purpose that, call it social capital broadly defined, and particularly the most vulnerable within the human uh, systems, they're the first ones that take, mm -hmm. get, get hammered by it. And so um, I just wanted to make that point. So now to your question, how am I doing? Yeah. I'm doing great. I mean, do you feel like you've, do you, do you feel like this has like become easier as you, as you get farther down the sort of the path so, of? You know, I, I think it's, um, I actually feel at an intellectual level, I feel like I've made some kind of real progress and, and defining this concept of, of what eco, our financial overshoot is. And, I, and I've got this idea of an economy that's a regenerative economy both socially, social capital regenerative and natural capital regenerative is very much the kind of North Star. I, I can see that and, and I, feel, um, I feel terrific about, you know, in, in, in a very collaborative effort with a lot of people that we sort of see where we need to head. Uh, explaining and articulating what that means in language that 
um, my daughter can understand and my former boss at JP Morgan can understand is, is, is really, really hard. And someone raised, I think, I think it was you, Jesse, storytelling. I mean, we're big into this storytelling thing and using art uh, and culture to, to communicate rather than just analytics and, and academics. Um, but, at a, but at a personal level, you know, I, I too have fear. I have three children. Um, you know, I'm relatively well off financially, um, but, um, but I'm poor compared to, you know, people that are really wealthy. And my instinct is that the wealthier you are, the more fearful um, you become, other than those that are truly, you know, at, a, at, a, at an exposed level already. But I think, you know, I don't know a lot of really, really rich people who feel really relaxed and comfortable these days. Um, and I know a lot of really rich people. I know, I don't know a lot of really rich people, but the ones I know are generally pretty unhappy. Um, but at a, you know, at a personal level and sort of my own, how am I dealing with this, I'm in the process of shifting my own financial investments into a theme I call, you know, a, a investing in resiliency. And, and I, I would proffer that, that resiliency is the investment thesis of the next 100 years. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of ways that when we were talking about this, there's lots of ways where you can invest in resiliency and, not, and they're not all you know, buy an organic farm and grow your food, although that's not a bad idea. Um, but they also are things, I mean, I think we need to understand that certain corporations mm -hmm. um, are far more resilient than most governments. Mm -hmm. And we can't be in denial about that. And so, um, you know, while I'm working hard to shift the way corporations um, uh, work in the world and how we understand their role in the world, we can't be naive and suggest that you know, there's not 50 or 100 global corporations that are far more resilient yeah. than nation states. And so as one thinks about their portfolio, I think we need to think differently than the conventional ESG, SRI kind of lens. Because, um, because we're on uh, the usual kind of limited time frame um, and because you've all been very attentive um, I wanted to. A rap singer taking our place. Yeah, rap mostly. star <laughs> taking our place. We got rid of the Blue Angels, but but we got other entertainment coming up, um, more organic, but still very much uh, live wire. So um, I wanted to make sure we had time for questions and or conversation with the audience. And I think Bjorn, someone has a microphone. We can get one of these. There we go. He's coming right around. So we'll. And Hi. we do have a hard time seeing you, so feel free to stand up and say who you are. So I'm Leonardo, I come from Brazil. I run a nonprofit in Brazil. We develop financial solutions for the social sector. Um, I, every time we talk about this portfolio, I think we end up focusing more about what instruments we're going to use, what type of uh, financial instruments will make sense with this uh, regenerative economy. But I tend to think about more portfolio of stuff we do in the world. And then my mind wanders off to, OK, what's the role of luxury goods, somebody was mentioning before, I mean, why do we need a ten, fifteen thousand dollar handbag? What does, what purpose does that serve? Uh, and I don't want to go off and say, well, that, that, that shouldn't exist. But at the same time, I, I cannot wrap my, round, my mind around why isn't that being dropped and we take on more organic farms with, a, with, a, with the same 15K? Anybody want to take that one? I, I, I completely agree. I, 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 yeah, I wandered into a shop on Sacramento Street yesterday, and the guy, I think now I realize he probably was tracking me so I wouldn't take anything, but I thought he just thought I was really maybe a good customer. So I pick up this little cute, really cute little bag. It was made to look like a book, and it was Gertrude Stein on the cover. I thought, oh, this is so cute. I opened it up. I, he showed me the back. It said 15 slash 16. I thought it was $15. <laughs> Then I opened it up, it's $2,000. And I thought, what am I doing in here? So I just sort of, you know, wandered on out. I don't know. We, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think we have to invest in those things. I think we can choose not to. But I mean, can, can, yeah, go ahead. Can I, obviously I agree with the premise, but let me be controversial. Um, and my daughter is a craftsperson, and so I'm, I'm very close to this now. And, you know, I wish we had more expensive handmade crafts, which, by the way, 
the industry that makes handmade crafts is incredibly sustainable, regenerative in many, many ways. Yes. And so if, if we spent more money than $2 on our t-shirt, but we spent $15 on a handmade mm -hmm. t-shirt or whatever, I'm just making this up, um, we'd be better off. So I don't think it's, you know, obviously $10,000 for a handbag is or 2, probably off, off base a little bit, but, um, but there are worse things we could do with our money than to buy a $10,000 handcrafted uh, handbag. Well, where, and where my mind met, went was towards the beginning of this conversation where one of you said, um, those are the things we just should not bother thinking about. I mean, there's a part of me that just sort of says, I've so long ago realized that I not only couldn't buy that handbag, but I didn't want to buy the handbag, and I didn't actually care about the handbag. I care a great deal about artisanal um, and, and very, very resilient um, craft making as an artist myself, so that I do care about, but that was kind of where And that the artist can actually make a living. Exactly, that artists are sustainable too. But there's actually a, a broader point that his example brings up is that human beings um, look for status in their culture, and so there are subcultures that are wealthy, and it's this, it's this sort of arms race of impressing your peers. And it doesn't matter where you are on the income level. There are people that get yeah. beyond that, obviously. But in general, for 95% of people, they're going to find a way to impress their peers. You know, we've got a race out here, for say, example. Like okay. yeah. um, and, and so what I think, and, th and, and this is part of the whole dynamic of, of needing to grow the economy and needing to have a consumer economy that is always growing, is you've got to find a way to increase consumer spending. And whether it's high up on those luxury goods or opening up uh, new, new global markets so you can bring the billion, two billion people that don't have cash income and into that market so they can start buying goods. You replace the, the informal economy of trade and community you know, economy with a formal economy of right. money systems. They're all related. We to get want to get a couple more, more questions out. Uh, Bjorn? Bjorn? I'm sorry, we have a couple more questions. Oh, he's got it. I'm sorry. I apologize. I can't see you. I can't see you. That's <laughs> hi, why it's... Hi, I'm, I'm Greg from CleanStar. Just a question for, uh, for John and, and Leslie. Um, completely by the, the argument that, that fundamentally you know, that the maths and the logic around overshoot you know, exists and that GDP, GDP growth is likely to be negative and substantially negative in the years ahead. But just a question for you guys in terms of this notion about are we going about it the wrong way in terms of, say, impact investing or searching for solutions and particularly particularly solutions that have that um, capacity to restore uh, you know, you know, if there are sort of winners and losers and I, I, I sort of believe that there are winners and losers and there will be a flight to quality in, like in any dislocation surely the the sort of the hunt for and, and betting with sort of solutions that have this either, either resilience or, or even better restorative uh, theme to them are, are the things that we should be focusing our efforts on so, 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 but, but the question is, um, you know, are we sort of betting against the notion of growth, or simply that that you know, stranded assets and and uh, you know some companies are just just going to fundamentally fail, and some economies and some governments and so on are going to fail, um, but that fundamentally you know the notion of of allocation towards you know restorative and and profitable and growing uh, enterprises is something that in itself is not you know not being rethought. Well, um, two thoughts came to me as you were, as you were asking or talking. Um, one is, is one of my favorite uh, quotes is Herman Daly talking about a steady state economy and how it's not a, just a static line. It's not just everything is just boring and straight all across. And it's, it's like nature. There's growth and death and cycles and ups and downs. And so it doesn't mean it's not interesting and exciting and that there won't be winners and, and losers. You can frame it that way or just things that are on the kind of the growth cycle and things that are fading out. Um, so that's one thing is, is um, that, that's how I, I kind of want to think about it. And I think it's, a, it's probably a little bit more um, realistic to think of it that way, which is, I think you were saying. And the other is, when we, when we say, are we going about it the wrong way? My, my issue is, if we, if we don't have this framework that is really tightly thought out and really logical and really makes sense, then we're, we're sort of 
relegating ourselves to this little marginal piece, even though this is a, fan this is a fantastic group of people and the energy is incredible. It's still a little kind of a little marginal group. It's still just a little speck. And so I just think we want to get, we want to, and I'm not saying we need to go knock on the doors and try to convince people. I just think we can, we can do it better by having this, this framework and operating within it and being very transparent and clear about what we're doing. And I know it'll, for me, it'll have, I, I'll be able to, um, it, it opens the, it opens the, uh, the, the universe of people I can, I can influence. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Janine, I think you've got the mic. Oh, yes, so Sorry. I actually want to speak one. to the issue of fear. So what I've discovered for my own portfolio is that I'm very fearful right now because I don't trust the methodologies of the past and I don't trust the markets currently. I think they're very manipulated by those who have a lot more wealth than me. And so what I've decided for myself is that if I keep following traditional investment philosophy, my future is really not in my control. And more likely than not, 20 years from now, I'll have a lot less money than I have today. So I've decided that I need to take control of this myself. I need to think about this very differently. I like Leslie's idea about a framework. I agree with that. And I need to start investing the old way, where you know the companies that you're investing in, and you know the things you're investing in. And if I'm going to do that, I might as well do it in things that have a social value for me, too. And I will likely screw up along the way, and I may end up losing my money. But I think I may lose up, end up losing my money now anyway. And at least this way, I'll have a lot more fun along the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can, Let's, I, can I make one quick Well, actually, no. I've got Bjorn okay. on me. So, okay. oh, Bjorn, sorry. how's our time? Time for out one more time. comment? Or out of time. I couldn't hear you. We're out of time. Out of time. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, John. Um, the, uh, actually, I'm really grateful that we started out small mm -hmm. and had you join us on stage. This was actually a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. it was and great. this was live stream, so I think it'll actually be one of the more substantive conversations that we've captured. And thank you also for all of you joining us and, and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon. There's some great programs here in this room uh, still to come, so come back and join us. I think it's at 3.30. Thanks. Thank you, thank you both.